and welcome to our Ocean Steward Spotlight. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, this event is an opportunity to highlight ocean stewards from diverse backgrounds and connecting ocean lovers with stories that may be important and inspiring to them. Let me introduce myself. My name is Sonia Sharon. I work at Oceana on our science and strategy team, and I will be your host for the, this evening. My background is in marine social science, and I focus on the impacts of marine policy on coastal communities. So today we're going to hear from Makeda Okolo. She is the Southeast and Caribbean Regional Lead for the National Ocean Services Office for Coastal Management within NOAA. From that seat, she co-founded the Southeast and Caribbean Environmental Justice Community of Practice with the National Wildlife Federation, as well as contributes to a number of other diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice efforts across the agency. Prior to this, she served as NOAA's Deputy Undersecretary for Operations and the Office of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs. Before joining NOAA, she spent 11 years working on Capitol Hill, where she served as the Energy and Environmental Policy Advisor to Congresswoman Donna Christensen from Virginia, and Makeda is originally from St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So let's jump right in. We want to get to know you. Can you tell us about your defining moment? Where and when did you fall in love with the ocean? Well, thanks for having me. It's awesome to be here and to be with all of your viewers. As you uh, mentioned in my bio, I'm from the Virgin Islands. I'm from St. Croix specifically, which is a, a tiny island community in the Caribbean. And so for me, you know, the ocean was a part of my life, as have us always been a part of my life. But I would say if there were one defining moment, it was um, one of my first times scuba diving, right? You know, it was the most peaceful I've ever felt, right, on Earth was actually being underwater. There was something so serene and so peaceful about being a visitor in this vast ocean space that just felt so magical and miraculous. Um, and, you know, to see corals, to see fish and just other marine life, just like living um, and going about their day, just, it, it was so serene um, and calming and centering, and it has left such an impression on me. And I would say the Caribbean waters are so crystal clear that I can imagine this as you're saying. <laughs> yeah. All right. So what are the big challenges in diversifying the makeup of people in the ocean sector that I see and that you noted in conversations with us is the need to develop the pipeline of future ocean stewards. So I'd love to hear from you, what advice do you have? And especially for communities that don't live near an ocean, how do you create that connection? Yeah, no, that's a really, a really, really good question. You know, I think for one, I think it's important for us to, to, to start with, you know, communities of color in particular that do live close to the oceans or historically have had a tie and a connection to the ocean, right? I think it's really critical to, to start there because, you know, those peoples have such spiritual and cultural and, you know, just intangible almost connections to the ocean that, for one, I think is really important as we think about marine policy, as we think about coastal management, we need to make sure that, that those that have these ties over generations remain, um, you know, as stewards and, and always have a seat at the table. That is critical first and foremost. That said, you know, I would argue that the ocean touches every one of our lives. And so even for those that don't live immediately near um, a body of water or weren't fortunate to grow up on an island, let's say, you know, I think it's important for us to, as an as a ocean community, um, to create those bonds. One initiative that I've been working on at NOAA is called the NOAA Ambassadors Program. And the goal is to find ways to connect the community with our mission. And part of that means also getting this information to schools, to students, to groups of people that may be more inland, um, may be in the center of the country, but to, to, to help to foster that love 
um, in them as well. You know, I mean, one easy way that, that folks are often connected to the ocean is, is by the food that we eat sometimes, right? Um, and so just even being, just being curious about, you know, where it comes from, you know, um, and what you can do to, to ensure sustainable populations for, for a long time, to ensure that the way you eat and the things that you love can be preserved for future generations, I think is just so key. Um, so it's something we need to be way more intentional about. Um, but, you know, I think it's super, super critical that, you know, diverse voices are at the table when we're talking about how we manage our coasts, how we manage our oceans, because we know where there's diversity, you know, where, where there is like, you know, new thoughts, unique thoughts, um, it makes us so much stronger and we go much further um, together than we would if we have very singular, um, very, you know, uh, yeah, just, just singular sort of ideas and thoughts on things. So it's something I'm really passionate about, especially because I'm from a community where when I was in high school, at least, our counselors constantly told us, oh, you should be an engineer or, oh, you should be a doctor. Like those were the two things that was instilled into our brains, right? And, you know, there's a missed opportunity in that there are so many ways that someone can, can have a career um, that does help them to, to support their family because that is important for a lot of people. Um, but that connects to, to the environment and that's important not only for a lot of the challenges we're facing right now with climate change and, and other things, but to ensure that our children get to see the beauty that, that we are able to, to take advantage of now and their children, of course, yeah. All right, so speaking of that, when you, informally talk to your friends and family, how do you engage them and like get them to care about oceans issues, especially conservation? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think just sharing, you know, like for me, I've had to make um, the work that I do a part of my life, a part of my ethos. So in, in how I communicate and what I share and what I do, what I do recreationally, often connects back to my work. And so I think just raising that awareness has helped them to be curious. And so when they hear about something concerning coral reef ecosystems, for example, or we live in a place where we get hit by, by, by um, hurricanes and extreme weather, they know to come to me. So I think it's being vocal, right, in sharing and also not forcing it, right? Because, uh, you know, for a lot of issues um, where conservation are concerned, you know, for so long, these issues have been approached in silos, and we can't do that anymore, right? We have to think about conservation um, and science and the environment in the context of culture, in the context of the economy, in the context of all the other things that people care about and need to survive. And I think once we weave those conversations in, then that's how we connect with people. So for me, it's in connecting with my local high school and having conversations about, hey, these are career paths that you can pursue that are connected to the oceans. And hey, we want you to be at the table making this decision as opposed to someone who's never been here before, right? Um, and I think, I think those are the ways that we help to raise the awareness and, and how I get to, to, to get them engaged. And then the other thing is I'm a mom, I have two little boys. And so whenever I can, I talk to their classes. I talk about the five coolest things about my job and I take them on virtual marine dives of sanctuaries in the Pacific and show them coral reef ecosystems. And that's like cultivating that love early, not only in my children, but hopefully in their friends as well. Okay, now I'm gonna put you on the spot. What are the five coolest things about your job? Oh my goodness. So if you were a first reader, <laughs> um, some of the things that I've told them about are, are hurricane hunters who literally fly into the eye of the hurricane, right? Like literally risking their lives so that we know what, what, what harm or what extreme weather is coming our way. Like I mentioned already, we, um, I took them on like virtual dives um, in, in, in America and Samoa. Um, another one was marine debris, right? So really beginning to understand that something as simple as your trash and not putting it in the right place can be harmful um, to, to flora and fauna. Um, and, and, you know, through that, we like showed them like really awesome, um, like Mad Lib stories. So they're having fun talking about like cleaning up marine, de marine debris and being really active. Um, also satellites, a big part of the NOAA mission focuses on launching satellites into space so we can understand space weather and so many other things. So I've shown them us launching satellites 
And then I'm blanking on the fifth one, but it may have been something like turtle excluder devices or something more fisheries related. But yeah, there are so many cool things about NOAA. So five is like not nearly enough. <laughs> not a first grader, but those things would get me as well. I think all of those are fun facts. Okay. Okay. Now we're gonna switch tactics a little bit and talk about an emerging theme in the marine space. And I'd love to get your thoughts on this. So there's been a call I would say in the last few years to rethink how we govern our oceans. And especially in regard to who's benefiting from policies and who gets left out. How have you seen this show up in your work and conversations and the communities you work in? So this is this is a good topic too. You know, I think one of the major places where I discuss it on a more regular basis is with the Southeast and Caribbean environmental justice community of practice. And you know, while it might not be specific to oceans, I think it's it's perhaps couched a bit in this larger discussion of environmental justice and climate justice, where, you know, it's really important to make sure that the people that stand to be impacted by a decision are actually in the driver's seat and at the table when a decision is being made. Um, a slogan that has stuck into my brain is, you know, nothing about us without us. And my understanding is that it was originally um, derived out of the disability community like in the 90s, but it's one that I'm seeing catching on where diversity, equity, and, and inclusion are also concerned as well, and specifically as it relates to coastal issues, to climate justice issues, to environmental justice issues. Um, and it's just the right thing to do, right? I mean, we cannot assume that people don't care. Um, it, quite to the contrary, there are extremely strong voices in, in, in small communities. Um, or in larger communities that rely on our oceans, that rely on our coastlines. And they have thoughts, they have opinions, and they also have the benefit of this extensive historical record, right? Because they've been there for generations. And so for these people not to have a seat at the table, not to be actively engaged is never okay. And so I think this drum roll that we're hearing, you know, I think is going to get louder and louder and louder. And I think hopefully what we'll see is something that is only for the betterment of our future generations, of, of having policies that are truly inclusive. Um, I think something that has been awesome is with, with, with the new administration that is in, we're seeing a lot of executive orders that touch on environmental justice, that talk about inclusion, that talk about benefits specifically um, being passed on to, to those that are more vulnerable or those that we have made vulnerable due to our policies over time. So. I think there's going to be some awesome work coming out of it, and I can't wait to kind of stay, stay, stay tuned in and, and, and track it some more. Yeah, that's exciting to hear that Noah is kind of on the front line of some of these issues. Um, all right, so through your role at NOAA, um, I know you do a lot of work in communities, um, specifically in the Southeast and Caribbean. How do you work and communicate with coastal communities? What are some of the considerations when you talk or do outreach with local stakeholders and residents? A lot. There's a lot of considerations, um, definitely, to keep in mind. I mean, and so I would sort of parse this out into two separate bins, if you will. I mean, for one, um, you know, as part of my formal role at NOAA, it's it's in working with coastal um, state coastal programs in the southeast, so Carolinas, Georgia, Florida, Puerto Rico, and the VI. And we have liaisons who work hand in hand with those coastal managers on a daily basis to make sure that they have the resources that they need to ensure that our coastal communities are, are safe and, and that we um, you know, ensure, ensure it for our posterity. Now, on the other hand, like we've talked about to some extent already, we're also doing this work, literally cultivating a community of, of, um, of ocean leaders and grassroots community leaders, but also folks from academia and you know, students and state government to actually, you know, stay together, talk about these issues, have a forum for us to share and stay engaged and learn from each other. Um, and so that's been sort of the main way as of late. We started the community of practice late last year. Um, we've been going strong since then. So that has been awesome. Um, you know, I think important to, to note that we had to acknowledge a number of things. For one, NOAA hasn't always been at this conversation, if you will, right? So we have to acknowledge that it's it's been newer for folks to see us actively engaging and participating and saying, hey, we want to listen, we want to hear. Um, because that's the first part of the trust building process, right? You have to acknowledge the history that has existed um, and, and, and do more listening than you do talking. 
and realize that even in creating a space for people to share, um, that that's a good thing. Um, another thing is just understanding that, you know, this has to be a reciprocal relationship, right? So as much as I love our community of practice members to come and share, it's also about me giving back, us giving back as well, right? So whether it's as simple as me sharing internship and fellowship opportunities or job announcements or other resources, um, you know, I think it's important to know that if you're asking, you also have to give. It, it has to be a give and take. Um, and there's been a number of other things that we've heard from, from our community members as well, you know, like to make sure you have safe spaces for community leaders to actually like decompress, to also have some learning activities as well. When you often mix huge groups together, someone's voice is going to get lost. And so one thing that's been really important for me is making sure that we find really safe spaces to hear those voices, to hear their needs, and then to see how can we leverage the resources that we have. Because, you know, my office, for example, does such amazing work. And my thing is, how can we make sure that everybody has a chance to take advantage of it? So a lot, so much more, but I know we're, we're, we're short on time, so I don't want to take up too much on that one. Yeah, you mentioned you guys started pretty recently, which means it's always been during the pandemic, correct? Correct. Uh, what does that look like? So it's virtual, right? And so, you know, I think it's going to be interesting as we sort of reintegrate into the workspace and, and, and we hopefully get more in touch with each other. Um, it's not clear how it's going to look. I will say what is unique about us being able to meet virtually is that it levels the playing field, right? Not everyone can't always get on a plane and, and go to a meeting. And so being able to stay connected via Zoom, we use a very, the same platform, um, has been incredible. And it also allows for us to include partners from Puerto Rico, from the Virgin Islands as well. And, and oftentimes when you're from a small insular area, you're so disconnected, right? By us just creating this space, we're allowing for sharing to happen on like major issues, right? Um, and that has been really special to hear a partner in the Virgin Islands talk about a refinery that was literally raining oil on rooftops and being able to connect with another partner in Florida who, who knows about air quality monitoring and knows about citizen science and hearing those connections happen um, has been incredible. And, and that's the work we wanna do to truly be of service. Um, and to create space. Like sometimes that's the biggest gift of all is just space and time. No, that sounds amazing. And I think in this last year, that's something we've kind of all needed is that way to connect with people and talk about the issues that we're seeing in the world. Okay, I'm gonna switch to something a bit lighter now. <laughs> what is the next, now that we're sort of coming into some sort of post pandemic normal, what's the next ocean place you wanna go when you can travel again? What's on oh. your list? Ocean place. So I'm supposed to go to the Bahamas in October. So that one is, is definitely going to happen. Um, St. Croix is always close to my heart and I don't let too much time pass before I get there. Um, but one ocean place that is on my bucket list is the Seychelles. I would love to get to the Seychelles at some point. Um, and then more diving. I haven't gone diving in a while. So that is always on my list. The last time I dove was in Hawaii and it was so amazing. Again, just that feeling of like peace and serenity um, and, and recognizing that you're a visitor. Like that's a very interesting sort of recognition, right? So, yeah. All right. So next, what is your favorite seafood dish? Oh my goodness, seafood. I mean, you eat seafood. I do. I do. I love seafood. Um, I was actually upstairs a second ago working on dinner, which is shrimp and butter sauce and black beans and rice and broccoli. Um, but again, I'm from the Virgin Islands. And so food and seafood is such a part of our, 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 our culture. So for me, seafood kalalu is definitely a favorite dish. I mean, it is a okra, uh, spinach. There's different like greens that are native to the Virgin Islands that are in there along with different types of seafood. So crab and um, conch and lobster and, you know, kingfish or whatever is all in there. Um, that's a big one. Or fish and fungi, which is, is typically a snapper um, that is in a beautiful sauce. And it's with like a cornmeal polenta-like um, ball. And it's amazing. So I love food. We can talk about food all day. <laughs> Delicious. I'm also from Georgia, so things like okra and shrimp speak in my language. Yes. Um, did your mom teach you how to cook? My aunt really was the one who taught me how to cook. Great. 
So I'm going to ask a question now for viewers out there um, who want to take action. What would you say to people who love the ocean but don't know what they should be doing to protect it? Small things, big things, what advice do you have for people out there? I think the first thing is to be curious, right? Okay. Never to just, you know, take anything at face value. If you see an issue, research it, right? Reading and educating ourselves and, and knowing more and learning more, I think is sometimes the most empowering thing that we can do. So that would be the first step. Um, beyond that, you know, figure out how you can get engaged in ocean conservation in your community. Um, that too can be a life-changing opportunity. One of the first things that, that I did that connected me to environmental science was doing beachside cleanups, right? Something so simple, but also impactful. Um, or planting mangroves, realizing that our mangrove systems help to protect us from hurricanes. And we know what havoc hurricanes can, can sort of wreak. And so to be engaged in that was like really, really um, special for me. So, you know, those sorts of opportunities are things that I think people should definitely get engaged in because when you're working with your hands, when you're literally connecting um, to the beach, to the water, um, it's, it's, it's transformative, right? You know, find a, a, a turtle nesting uh, or, 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 or turtle ha hatching that, that you can see um, and then get curious about what are the needs of, of, of those turtles. Um, and then, you know, I think there are other ways. I love policy. It's, you know, been a part of me for a super long time. So I think there's, there's also power in understanding what legislation may exist that would impact, um, you know, the marine wildlife or, or ecosystems wherever you live, right? Um, and even if you don't live close to the oceans, you can still be connected to any one of these issues and play a really active role in helping to make a difference. You know, we, we have a saying back at home, which is one, one fills the basket, right? And so it's literally that, you know, one by one, you can actually fill a basket. You don't, you know, it's not filled automatically, but, you know, coming together, each person bringing what they have to the table, I think we can see a difference that way. So I think it's, it's not feeling too overwhelmed either. It's just knowing that we all have to do our part and just knowing that you're doing one little thing um, for our oceans, for our coastal communities, I think is, is, is a big gift that you can give. So you mentioned um, people getting curious, seeing things. Where do you see the role? Like I've seen a lot of people now interested because of nature documentaries. And now I follow photographers on Instagram. I think social media is really pushing out the aesthetics of the ocean and cool fish and what's going on. Have you seen that sort of help with the uptake of being interested in these issues? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I think social media plays such a huge role. Um, you know, one thing I have been seeing on social media is sort of the emergence of tons of like travel bloggers, of, of, of travel um, being more accessible to people and folks wanting to just get their camera out, even if it's just you know, their phone, if they have, you know, an iPhone or an Android, you can take pretty good pictures with these phones. Um, and that connects you to a world of people all across the globe. And I think that is something that's really unique. That's making people curious, getting them curious. You know, um, art is also something that I think is, is doing amazing things as well. We recently had a number of murals installed around St. Croix, all ocean related, um, that are just beautiful and also just, you know, I think the beauty you see when you look at the mural also reminds you of the beauty of the ocean. And so I think the arts also play a really critical role. And then the mommy and me will have to talk about, you know, cartoons, right? Media um, is also really, really huge. I mean, my kids have learned so much from things like the Octonauts, which uses Noah Science or Wild Kratts, a PBS show, which, you know, is really like two brothers exploring um, nature. Um, and, and in that, you know, they say if you, if you, if you teach a child, you can educate a nation, right? And so um, helping our, our children to, to understand the importance of the oceans is something that is also making a huge difference, I think, because then they start to teach me. And that's when you know um, you're, you're really going to see some change. I love that. Yes. I mean, we're here on social media ourselves. Right. <laughs> All right. So we have two major audiences here. We have people who are just getting into the conservation space and figuring out their values and how they connect to the ocean. And then we have people who have been working in this sector for years and are professionals. So this question is gonna be for oceans community leaders already at work out there. 
what is your vision for the ocean conservation community? So those of us who are passionate, are practitioners, um, are just citizens, how would you like to see it grow and change and find a direction? Um, like, what is your vision for the evolution of this community? Yeah, I think it's two things. One is to see more diversity in, in ocean conservation. That would be the, the, the first and foremost one. Um, because like I said, where you have unique and diverse minds coming together on problems, we're gonna see such innovation coming out of that. The issues that are facing us now from, a, from an environmental perspective on climate, on, on extreme weather, on coral disease, you know, these are enormous issues that are advancing and or, or degrading from whichever part of the, the spectrum you, you choose to kind of think about it at like lightning speed. Um, and so to continue examining these issues the way that we have, we know that we won't win against it. And so for one, I really think that um, diversity, inclusion, having seats at the table, building the pipeline, recognizing that we have to start younger, right? It's not just about offering a fellowship and an internship. It's about, you know, connecting people at, at very young ages and, and, and lighting that fire in them um, so that they can be stewards. You know, um, the, 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 the second one for, for me is something else I alluded to earlier, which is not working in silos, right? We, we have to reimagine the way that we work with communities. Um, it may also mean re reimagining our goals, reimagining re what success looks like. Um, success may have to be re-baselined with what a community actually needs. Um, and so thinking about, you know, working with new partners, right? It's not, it's not just with the same people. We will continue to get the same results if the same people are at the table. So working with new organizations, I think also, it, you know, something else that we've talked about a little bit, you know, not, not, not working in silos, understanding that all of these issues impact people at, at different way, in very different ways. So how does this issue connect to culture, connect to livelihoods, um, connect to, to, to history and, and how we think about things going forward? I think when we start to integrate our work much more and more intentionally into people's lives, I think that is what could really make a difference. Um, because, you know, for a lot of people, you know, they see conservation as a luxury. They see it, the environmental movement as a luxury, something that they can think about after their lights are on, after they have food on the table for dinner, after their rent is paid, right? And so we have to recognize that these are the challenges that the vast majority of the country and the world actually have to think through. That's their first lens. Um, and then after that comes, comes a number of other things. So I think to the extent that, that we can um, close that gap, um, where, where we can be more seamlessly integrated and connected and thoughtful, intentional, and in tune, I think that's where we're going to see a lot of, a lot of advancement on, on the issues that we dedicate our lives to. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree. And I will say in the time that I've been in the sector, I have seen movement towards a more people-centered conservation approach. Um, and so, yes, I am hoping that we continue to evolve in that direction. Agreed. There's so much more time we could spend talking about some of these topics, um, but our time is slowly coming to an end. I think we have a couple more minutes left to wrap up, and we want to make sure we can share how people can find out more about you and your work. We're going to throw your info up on the screen now, or someone will. <laughs> I'd love to know from you um, any parting words for people watching, last words of advice, things they should be keeping an eye out for. So, I mean, you know, just thank you. I think it's awesome that that Oceana is taking the time to highlight diverse voices in the ocean space. I think continuing to do this is, is one of those steps. It's one of those one things that we're all going to use to fill the basket. Um, you know, I think from, from my seat with the environmental justice community practice, my goal is to connect with as many community leaders, individuals, curious people, um, all across the coastal co co communities of the Carolinas, Georgia, Florida, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. I want to hear your stories. I want to engage with you. And however possible, I want to make sure that we can share um, the resources that we all have, you know, with you. So that's, that's, that's it for me. Um, definitely, you know, get in touch with me. I'm sure we can get my email address 
um, somewhere at the at the bottom of this screen, but it's makeda.okolo at noaa.gov. Um, and that's it for me. It, this has been awesome. Yeah, I'm so glad that I was able to talk to you and that you had time and spent your time with us this evening while your food is cooking, enjoying the <laughs> information, um, shared about your personal life and your work and your connection to the ocean. Um, so please remember those of you out there to watch our next Ocean Steward Spotlight on August 5th with Helen Ladson. And I think that's it for us. Thanks everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye.